The East Long Meadow DPW announces much anticipated plans to fix Elm Street. We'll lay it out for you. Now that residents voted yes at the last town meeting, LCAT gets details on plans for new municipal space for town employees. And a new class offered at the high school is in the spotlight. We'll look at the blood and guts of the curriculum. Those stories and Spartan Sports highlights tonight on LCAT News Week in Review. Good evening, I'm Alexi Cohan. We begin tonight with a big sigh of relief for town residents who live along Elm Street. For years, residents have complained about the condition of Elm, and for years, town officials have tried to secure federal and state funding to fix it. Now, the DPW is taking matters into its own hands. The DPW Board of Public Works has decided to take Elm Street on their own hands. Um, as many people might recall, we had attempted to get federal monies for it, through the Transportation Improvement Program, or the TIP process. That started back in 1985. We've been working with the state diligently, drawing up plans, getting on the TIP list, meeting with various governmental agencies and whatnot. The reality is, is the criteria for federal projects has changed. And as much as we all feel that Elm Street's a really bad street, in the eyes of the federal government, it's not that bad a roadway. Here is being held. Kelly explains that the town waited for financial aid as long as possible, but the time to get the job done is now. The initial project went from $1.9 million up to $4.7 million, which would include a major reconstruction, new drainage, new sidewalks, new curbs, everything else. So as somewhat of a compromise, seeing as we weren't going to be able to get any federal monies, uh, the board did decide to save up some of our Chapter 90 money, which is the money we receive from the state, which is used specifically for roadway or sidewalk improvement projects, and we are going to be doing Elm Street over. We are not going to be doing the ultimate or the, the Cadillac of paving. We'll be more middle of the road. What we plan on doing is taking up about an inch and a half to two and a half inches of the existing asphalt, readjusting a lot of the structures, the manholes, storm drains, things like that. And we'll also be doing a little bit of grading work where needed. The project will go out to bid November 21st with an absolute completion day of August 2014. However, the target is April 2014. The project will also include parts of Chestnut Street, Meadowbrook Road, Pease Road, Tompkins Avenue, West Allen Ridge, and Anthony Drive. I think this will be a relief for a lot of the residents, at least town-wide, the residents that are um, upset with the condition of Elm Street. What I also didn't mention is we have an um, ancillary bid that is going out probably within the next month or so and will be opened up sometime in January, I would estimate. But the lights that are located directly behind me here, a lot of people have complained uh, about the traffic backing up at different times. Our intent is going to be to replace the entire system, all the electronics, the wiring, the underground mechanisms, the control when the lights go on and off. Um, that work, we have $150,000 that was awarded at town meeting a year and a half ago. Um, that is a capital project that was approved. So we're finishing up the engineering on that, and like I said, we should be going out to bid. The estimated total cost of the Elm Street project, approximately $870,000. The East Long Meadow Board of Selectmen is looking into new municipal space to ease overcrowding at the town hall. The issue was a big part of the special town meeting last month. Elcat talked to the chairman of the Board of Selectmen for an update. Michael Nevins has our story. The new town hall has always had an issue regarding space. And the issue was brought to the table during the town meeting on October 21st, 2013. We spoke to Paul Federici, who gave us an overview on what happened. They voted yes to allow us to uh, pursue a potential building in town to expand our town space for our town offices. Federici identified that the town hall is too small for the growing town of East Long Meadow and had a warrant put into the special town meeting. The voters voted yes, allowing the town to go into the next part of the process. Uh, the next part of the process, because um, all, all government agencies are tied into a competitive bidding process, 
even though we have actually looked at a specific building, we can't just go identify that building and uh, proceed from there. We have to actually go through a bid process. We have to get together what's called a request, request for proposal, which will have our the parameters that we're looking for in this property, um, and we will we will put that out, publish that in the newspaper, and anyone who's interested who has a property in East Longmeadow that they think might fit our parameters can put in a bid on on any potential property, and then we will review those properties and find the uh, find the one that's the, the the best fit in all our categories that we're looking for. The new town hall would likely feature a major improvement. Any new building that we get is going to have to be um, ADA compatible, meaning it's going to have to be compatible for people with disabilities, which as uh, says Town Hall isn't, but Town Hall is grandfathered in because of its age. Uh, but any new building that we try to, that we attempt to get will have to have that as, as one of the parameters that we're looking for when we go out to bid. We'll still be using the old Town Hall for, for certain uh, different different offices however what we're trying to do because because a new building will be ADA compatible we'll, we'll be trying to get most of the um, town offices that that deal with the general public in there so that way they can uh, they can have easier access to the different offices Federici assured us that this was the best for growth and development in East Long Meadow if we identify a building and we can one, one thing that the town allowed us to do is to actually we can't buy the building yet because we have to go to town the town for the vote for that but we can actually, ho well, hopefully we'll be able to secure it with sort of a short-term lease with an option to purchase. And that way, because anyone who's got a building that's going to fit our parameters, it's, it's probably for sale. So they're in it to make money, so they're not going to just sit around and wait for the town. So we have to sort of act fast on this and at least somehow identify a building and get it under agreement before the town meeting in May. With OCAT News, I'm Michael Nevins. A new class offered at East Long Meadow High School is drawing a lot of attention for all the right reasons. It's a cross between the popular CSI show and a college level forensics course. It's been featured in several local publications, so we decided to take a closer look at the East Long Meadow class of forensic science. Blood spatters, autopsies, and fingerprints? No, this isn't a crime scene or an episode of CSI. East Long Meadow High School is now offering a new rigorous honors level forensic science course taught by Kate Wallen. The class covers several unique topics. What we do in um, forensics is we first do basic history of it. Then we move to hair and fiber analysis, trace analysis. We do drug identification. Then we move to my favorite, blood spatter. So we do blood spatter. We do where did the blood come from, the angle, the height, uh, the direction. And then we move to glass fracture patterns, track and trail patterns, uh, arson patterns. Then we move from that, all kinds of patterns, to um, ballistics and firearms identification, which is path of the bullet as well as matching bullet to the cartridge. We don't do bullet to gun because of the setting that we're in. And then we move to um, anthropology, which is I give them a piece of a bone and they have to tell me the sex of the person, the height of the person, the race of the person, and any other post-traumatic features. In comparison to standard level forensics classes originally offered at East Long Meadow High School, Honors Forensics is much more challenging as it mimics a college level class condensing the greatest parts of college forensics into one. For what we do in Honors Level is we take what we do in standard and just kind of kick it up and we add a lot more topics and the topics in depth. So there's always like additional projects they're working on at home and our labs are that much more in depth. Wallen spent a great amount of time and effort getting the class up and going with the help of a grant and the support of the East Long Meadow High School Administration and School Committee. And you need at least $3,000 to start the course. And so I wrote a grant called Toyota Tapestry and they gave me $10,000 which also paid for a class uh, to just buy all the equipment, all the magnetic brushes, a skeleton, you know anything that I needed and it was fantastic I had to link it to literacy so in each of the labs we always have a pre-reading which you have to extract data you have to kind of look at a case look at evidence and things like that and um, it was a year-long project that they kind of tracked how I was doing lab work is a big part of making the grade in honors forensic science um, it the class is a little misleading where we actually don't have a lot of tests that may sound good to some people, but it's all lab based. So the accumulation of a group of labs is a crime scene. 
So you, you can go in with your labs and I set up a crime, they're all done in a bathroom and you have to go through and I'll mark all the data and you have to tell me what does this data mean and then you have to reconstruct it. So you not only have to identify the data, you have to individualize it and then tell me the sequence of events. Walland encourages any interested student to give the course a try. Um, it's a great course and even if you're not into forensic science, um, I like to say that my course is all about thinking. It teaches you how to think critically, how to you know, analyze beyond what you think is there. So even if you're not into the CSI or the forensics, it's a good course to take just to get your skills on deductive reasoning. It's playoff time for Spartan Sports. Tony Santinello has LCAT Spartan Sports. Hello everyone, Tony Santinello with LCAT Sports. Let's start with the Spartan boys soccer team as they open the postseason with a home game against the Red Raiders from Commerce High School on Friday night. Matt Mooney scored two goals to lead the Spartans to a 4-0 victory, while Nick Lambert and Chris Kokotis added one goal each for East Long Meadow. The Spartans were able to shut down Western Massachusetts leading scorer Iyesu Michael, who had 30 goals on the season entering the contest. On Monday night, East Long Meadow would travel to Amherst to face the Hurricanes for the third time this season. Amherst scored early as they jumped out to a 2-0 lead at halftime. They would add another and go up 3-0 as things didn't look good for East Long Meadow. However, with 18 minutes to go in the game, Reed Phillips got the Spartans on the board and Nate Madeira followed up with another less than a minute later to bring the Spartans to within a goal. Amherst answered the call by scoring six minutes later and went on to win 4-2. The boys' soccer team is a resilient group and finished the season with a 9-8-3 mark. Matt Mooney finished his senior year with a very impressive 23 goals on the season. And finally, the Spartan football team played host to Westside. The Terriers jumped out to a 14-0 lead after the first quarter, but East Long Meadow came back to tie it up at halftime behind Western Mass rushing leader Mike Magipinto, who now has 1,430 yards on the season. When all was said and done, Magipinto rushed for 248 yards on 31 carries and crossed the goal line six times, giving the Spartans a 45 to 34 victory and locking up the number three seed in the playoffs. The Spartans will face the Bombers again on Friday night in Westfield as Coach Scott Raymond looks for revenge from just two weeks ago. That does it for me. I'm Tony Santanello with LCAT Sports. That'll do it for us tonight. Thank you for joining us on LCAT's News Week in Review. I'm Alexi Cohan. Good night.